Thank you for coming. Hopefully, I can share some details with you on databases. So in terms of what I'm going to talk about, I've been involved with databases at AWS for about seven years, which is roughly how long our services have been around on the database space. So I've had a chance to be involved with pretty much all of them in some stage or form. And uh, along with giving you an overview, I'm also going to make sure that I kind of talk a little bit about the strategy and the story behind the the services and why we built them and what were some of the use cases we were targeting. So hopefully that'll give you a sense of these services and when you should use them. And also towards the end, talk a little bit about of all the things that we do, what are the best use cases for each service. I'll give you a sense of the scale at which this business operates. You know, Andy last year at reInvent uh, in October when we had the last reInvent, he talked about how our database business was over a billion dollars in revenue run rate, and it's continued to grow since then. So it's a pretty sizable business for us, which means that these services that we're talking about are used at scale by lots and lots of customers, which should give you a lot of comfort that for use, your use cases, they should be able to meet your needs. <clears throat> All right, let me start with the strategy a little bit. And I'll start with a true and tried principle, which Amazon has been based on from the very beginning 20 plus years ago when the company started. You know, everything we do starts with the customer. So when we design these services or any services, for example, we start with who the customer is, what is the problem that the customer is having that we are trying to solve with the service, and we work backwards from it. And if you would think about the reason why Amazon and AWS have been successful over the last 20 years, it's most of it goes back to this principle that we follow in everything we do. The way we do it is that when you are trying to start a new service, before you write a line of code, you end up writing the press release. So today we announced Athena, we announced the Postgres version of Aurora and a number of other services in Andy's keynote. You know, the press releases you saw there, a version of those press releases was probably done long back before we even decided that we were gonna solve these problems because this puts us in the framework and the mindset of what the customer is trying to do and what problem we're trying to solve, if we have any value to add for that customer and that for use case, and it really enables us to do services that in the end solve real customer problems. The second thing you'll see across all of the services that I'm gonna talk about are that these are all managed services where the basic idea is that if you're an application developer, you probably are not going to win in your business because you are an expert on databases, that's something that you maybe have done in the past out of necessity, but if we can take away the muck with having to manage and deal with the databases as we do for all, everything else at AWS, that probably frees up cycles for you to do things that are more closer to your business and could add value for your own customers and your services that you're trying to do. So we try to do everything as a managed service. You'll find that you know, if you, and I will speak to this as I go through the services, you'll find that we differentiate ourselves in terms of leveraging the cloud architecture. Compute is basically free, if you will, in the cloud. It's available to the extent that you want to use it, and we leverage that heavily to enable new kinds of use cases that were probably not possible before the cloud came along and AWS came along. So you'll see that throughout our strategy. And we don't believe in lock-in, so we give you a mechanism to bring the data that you want to bring and to take away and take out the data of the cloud if you want to take it out. So you are free to use our services or use something else on AWS or not use AWS at all. And finally, I would say that the difference between us and every other probably provider is the breadth of services that we offer, and we believe that no single service will serve all use cases. Uh, As Andy was saying in the keynote, if you want to build a house and all you have is a hammer and a few nails, you can probably build an okay house, not going to be a great house, it's going to cost you a lot of money, it's going to take you a long time. It's the same thing that we really believe in uh, databases. So depending on the use case, you will see different databases that we offer. In fact, on this slide, I bucket all of the different services that my team does in the database and analytics space and really think about them in four buckets or four big areas. Relational, which has been around 30 plus years, is certainly the first service that we launched uh, with RDS, and I'll speak to each one of these services. The second area is big data, where you know, there's lots of data we all are dealing with, and we are giving you a set of services. We announced Athena today, which is our you know, youngest child, 
It's about, uh, I guess, a day old, not quite. And then we have all the analytic services, starting with QuickSight, which we you know, announced uh, for preview last year, and we went into GA a little bit ago uh, this year, and many other services. And then, of course, I'll talk about NoSQL and in-memory databases with uh, the services that we have in that space. And I'll speak to, uh, we'll give you a sense of the scale at which this operates, both in terms of the, uh, some of the stats that I'll share with you. Some of these were shared by Andy this morning as well and then some of the customers that uh, use all of these services. So Aurora is now our fastest growing service in the history of AWS, which is AWS is now 10 years old and saying a lot in terms of the service that's been out there for a little over a year. It's something that we GA in uh, end of July last year is already our fastest growing service. Database migration service, which we went GA with in February, March timeframe this year, so it's not quite a year old. We have already migrated over 14,000 databases to AWS from on-premise, EC2, from commercial databases, and so on, and I'll speak to this quite a bit. And to just give you a sense of scale, DynamoDB is something that we use just like we do for every other service we build inside our own company. So Amazon and AWS use DynamoDB quite extensively. I joke that Jeff Bezos is my biggest customer, or one of my biggest customers. And uh, Prime Day, DynamoDB did 56 billion extra queries worldwide compared to the same day previous week. So give you a sense of scale at which these services operate. And here is just a few of the customers that use our various database services. Are companies like Lyft, Airbnb that are doing new applications and disrupting lots of existing businesses in the taxi and hotel space. There are companies like Intuit and NTT Docomo and Nokia and many others that are bringing their existing workloads and doing new things at scale uh, in AWS and using all of our services. So it just gives you a sense of the kinds of people that are doing it and kinds of services they're doing it so that you can be comfortable that these are services that are mature and being used broadly. Let me quickly go through the relational part of the services where we have three services that I'm gonna talk about, RDS, Amazon Aurora, which uh, Andy spoke to also this morning, so I'll go through that pretty quickly, and then the database migration service. Uh, so RDS is something that we launched in October of 2009, so it's uh, over seven years that service has been in operation. We really, in the beginning, started with MySQL as the first database in 2009, then in 2010 we launched the high availability version of it, which I'll speak to, and then every year, We've continued to enhance the service, and at this point, it's a fairly mature service, which pretty much offers you a variety of engines that you could use with it. So whether you're using Oracle, SQL Server, MariaDB, MySQL, Postgres, or what have you, RDS is the way to go. So if you need to do relational databases, the simple answer is use RDS. And it does things that, uh, you know, is really muck in terms of the database management. So it's patching, it's scaling, it's backup and restore, it does automatic backups on a regular basis to S3 so that you have high durability. Uh, it gives you lots of options in terms of the size of databases. You can go up to six terabytes for all of the engines except Aurora, which I'll speak to. And it gives you a high availability option that we call multi-AZ, and I'll speak to that as well. But the basic idea is that if you're doing production databases, High availability is something that's obviously critical for your application, and we make that push button simple with RDS. So let me go into why we build this service. I've spoken to that a little bit, but obviously Amazon.com as a major uh, company with over $100 billion in revenue now, you know, is obviously using a lot of databases. So we have, uh, at this point, 20 years of experience running databases. In that, that sense, we're quite a bit different than many other vendors who build databases but don't really use them at scale, so we don't, we, they don't understand some of the issues that customers run in, in a first-hand basis like we do, so we realize that you know, just managing these databases is just a pain. And if you look at the leading cause of lost sleep in the IT industry, it probably comes to two things, networking and databases. So we want to try and make sure that at least from the database perspective, we give you back some time to sleep instead of being able to wake up at night to deal with these databases that fail. And that's the reason why we designed uh, RDS. And we've done simple things like we have reduced the total cost of ownership for you because we take away 
the muck associated with setting up databases, configuring them, backing them up, and so on, so that it gives you leverage from your own teams, and you can have the team do more things which are you know, going to differentiate your own applications and the things that you're trying to do. And the second thing that we've done, as I mentioned, is enable high availability, which I'll speak to in greater detail. And it's now possible for even a small company, which previously did not have access to multiple data centers, to use the architecture of multiple data centers, which we call availability zones, in AWS to create high availability architecture. And this is where we start to leverage the architecture of the cloud. So here's the architecture of how high availability works. Essentially, you go into either a console or use an API when you're creating a database. And you simply say that this database needs to be a multi-AZ database, which means that it lives in multiple availability zones. And there is a master, which is in one availability zone. There is a standby that's in a second availability zone. We do uh, replication in a synchronous way between these two because these availability zones are a single region. So they, even though they are flood and uh, you know, distance isolated, they may be 10 to 100 miles apart. In terms of latency, they only have one to two millisecond latency between them, so we can easily do synchronous replication, which means that you don't have any concerns from a durability or availability perspective. Uh, you know, we have sort of become experts in recognizing and detecting all of the possible failures that can happen either at the server level, at a rack level, at a data center level, or those kinds of things, we automatically detect those failures. We fail you over within 30 to 45 seconds to another database, which is your standby database in a different data center. And your application simply does a retry and then finds that the DNS name, which was maybe talking to the master database in availability zone one, is now talking to another database. There's not any change to the data because it's been synchronously replicated. And you're able to move forward without any issues. And you're able to leverage this even though you may be a small company or a startup, or even if you're a large company, people don't have access to the multiple data center architecture that we make available. And this is something you just do with a push button or an API call. Here are some of the customers that are using it. Uh, Airbnb is one of my favorite customers. They uh, you know, were born in the cloud, if you will, in uh, AWS in, I think, 2008. And they've been using the service since uh, the day one when it came out. It took them 15 minutes of downtime in those days to flip over to using um, RDS MySQL, and they've been with it ever since. And it's all the reasons I described why people use RDS is the reason they do it. They use multiple, uh, multiple availability zones so that they have high availability. They use read replicas to get scale. It's a pretty neat uh, use of the database. Uh, that we've built over the last seven years. So let me go now from here to talking about Aurora and in terms of how we decided to build our own engine and what is the thinking behind building a database from scratch and what are some of the questions that we asked. And the basic idea we had was, well, you know, the databases that I've talked about so far, Oracle, SQL Server, MySQL, Postgres, and so on, these are all great databases, but they were all designed before the cloud came about. And if you have ever done software development, which everybody in this room has done, you know that when you start with designing a software system, you take a certain set of goals. And what is always true is that anything you design meets a subset of the design goals you have because reality kicks in, time kicks in, resources kick in. You always decide that to get something out, you're not gonna meet everything that you started with. You certainly don't ever meet requirements that you did not imagine when you designed the system. That never happens. So if these databases were designed before the cloud came about, they clearly were not designed with cloud as the design principle. So what we did was we said, okay, let's design a new database where cloud is a given, and the only constraint we take is that it's a relational database, and perhaps make it compatible with an existing API. We started with MySQL because it was very popular, and today we added Postgres. Just took those constraints and say everything else is available for redesign and re-architecture. It took us five years, but we came up with Aurora, which meets some really interesting needs that I'll talk about. And so, so basically the idea here, as this is something that Andy talked about at length in the keynote, I'm sure a lot of you were in the keynote, so I'm not gonna go into this in too much detail. The basic idea is that we give you commercial grade performance and availability 
and we maintain compatibility with MySQL 5.6, and we give you at open source prices, which are one-tenth the cost, or even less than that compared to what you pay for, for commercial databases. Here, let me go into some more details here. Sorry. Yes. So as I said, it is uh, compatible with MySQL. It's uh, significantly more performance. In terms of, if you look at our instance types that we use, the largest instance type that we support for Aurora is R38XL, which gives you, with Aurora, something like 100,000 writes per second and 500,000 reads per second compared to MySQL, which will do 20 and 100,000. So MySQL would do roughly 20,000 writes a second at 100,000 reads a second, whereas we do five times as much. We allow you to go up to 64 terabyte databases, which is a pretty large database for an OLTP application. Uh, in fact, uh, I was checking before this, uh, this talk as to who is my largest customer and what is the largest database that they have. And as you would expect, the largest database is very close to 64 terabytes. It's actually 63 terabytes. If we had enabled 128, I suspect I would have a customer with 127 or 28 terabytes in the database. We enable uh, you to have 15 read replicas with this, so you can actually go up to 7.5 million reads per second, which is quite amazing in terms of the scale. And this is highly available and durable by default. So when you do a write to Aurora, we write it to six places. And we write two copies in each availability zone, and we write to three availability zones. So there's no chance of you losing the data. There's going to be durability issues at all. It's designed for 99.99% .99 availability. We do continuous incremental backups to S3. And in case you had a logical error or something like that where you need to roll back, that's something you'll be able to do pretty easily. And here are some of the customers, GE, Expedia, Zynga, Ticketmaster, many others that are adopting this. In many cases, they're adopting that in terms of using, in place of using MySQL. A lot of people are moving from Oracle. And here's a use case I'll give you of uh, one customer that is using it. This is a you know, tr company from the travel industry. And these guys. Uh, are getting significant benefits from moving to Aurora. In this case, they moved from SQL Server. And they have seen uh, significant improvement in performance. They've seen significant uh, improvement in the cost profile. So the cost is significantly lower than using SQL Server, obviously. One of the neat features that we recently introduced in it is that the 15 replicas that you have, you don't have to decide where your traffic goes. We give you a single endpoint, and we round robin the traffic to the number of replicas you have. So it becomes really seamless for you to maintain the load balance for your uh, read traffic to this. And of course, today, Andy announced the Postgres compatible version of Aurora, which is 9.6 compatible and supports all of the features. You get all of the goodness of Aurora. So you get six copies. You get 64 terabytes. You get uh, 15 read replicas. But you have compatibility with Postgres, which many customers prefer because they are using Postgres or they are moving from Oracle to Postgres because of the semantic differences are a little bit less. It's uh, got, you know, instead of PL SQL, it's got PG SQL, which is something that people can convert to. And for those reasons, this is something that's been a high demand, high request for us for over a year. And we are happy to be able to make it available in a preview. And you can sign up for it today if you're interested. We're also introducing, along with the Postgres version of uh, Aurora, you know, something called Performance Insights, which is basically a console that helps you figure out if your queries are running slow, what's happening with your queries, and be able to debug your performance issues that you might be having in your application code to be able to figure this out. And this is something which we are starting with Aurora Postgres, but we will make it available through all of the engines of RDS over the next few months as we uh, get this to scale. All right, so with that, let me move to the third relational database service, which is uh, very appropriately named as a database migration service. In fact, as I go into the details, you will find that it is we are underselling what this service does by simply speaking to the use case that is the most common one. It's actually much more than a migration service. It's a replication engine which can replicate data from on-premise to the cloud or from the cloud to the on-premise databases. And the basic idea here is that at scale, when people are moving to the cloud, they don't want to take downtime 
with the databases to move. So the way this works is that you do a dump and load of a certain version of your database to the cloud. Then you use data migration service to sync the database that you still have running and taking transactions on premise with the one that you just dumped and loaded into AWS. And then over time, this syncs up, depending on the kinds of transaction rates you're taking. And based on that, at some point, when it's completely caught up, you just flip over. And with a very little downtime of a few minutes or less, you're able to get over to work in the cloud. If you don't want to do migration, but you just want to use it for some kind of a replication use case where maybe you're using the cloud for disaster recovery or you want to still keep some uh, databases running on, on premise, you can keep these databases in sync. So it's more than really just a migration service. It lets you do more. We also, along with it, give you a schema conversion tool, which again, we are underselling. It says schema conversion, but really what it allows you to do is if you're moving from, let's say, an Oracle or SQL Server database to Aurora, not only do you need to move the data, which the migration service will move across engines, you also need to convert your schema, you have to convert your PL SQL code, your application that uses a certain syntax with SQL uh, statements that you use need to be converted, and this will make it easier for you to convert it. It probably will get 60 to 70% of your code automatically converted, and then it'll point out all the places where it couldn't convert for you, and then you have to go ahead and convert those things. And it's quite cheap. A terabyte database can be converted or migrated for as less as $3. And here are all of the different uh, source and engines as well as uh, destinations that we support. So you can really go from all of the major commercial and open source databases to essentially open source databases as well as our versions of them. So you can go to, you know, at, you'll see you can go from SQL Server to Aurora or Postgres, Oracle to Aurora, MySQL, Postgres. Or you can go from Teradata and Itiza, Greenplum, et cetera, or Oracle to Redshift. So this is something that allows you to go from commercial databases to open source, as well as go from open source or commercial databases on-premise to on-cloud. We have many customers that are using Oracle on-premise. They keep some of the workloads on Oracle and RDS and move it over, and the other ones they convert to uh, using on, say, Aurora. Here are some examples of some of the customers that are using, and I'm going to go into one of the use cases with Trimble, where they use the data migration service to move from Oracle that they were using in their own data center to moving to Postgres on RDS. And they use the conversion tool, the schema conversion tool, to convert the schema, to convert the PL SQL to PG SQL, and so on. And they, uh, you know, it reduces the effort that they had to make to move to the cloud. OK. So I guess the message on relational is, if you want to use relational, you should use RDS. If you already have an application that uses a certain engine and you prefer to stay with that engine, then you can move to RDS with that engine, whether it's Oracle, SQL Server, or what have you. Uh, if you are designing new applications or you're using MySQL and Postgres, you'd be best served by directly doing those on Aurora because you'll get full compatibility but all the benefits. If you're coming from commercial databases, we'll encourage you to move to uh, Aurora because it'll save you money and give you much better performance. Let me speak quickly to NoSQL and in-memory databases. And here, I'm going to start with DynamoDB, which is a service that we uh, launched in January of 2012. So it's been around for uh, many, many years, and it's used quite extensively, both inside and outside uh, Amazon. It's a highly scalable, flexible database. And I'll go into uh, how we started with it, what were some of the questions that we asked to design it, and what are the use cases that you should apply it to. So the history for NoSQL at Amazon goes back to 2004. And uh, you know, Amazon historically was an Oracle shop. So in 2004, we were running, during the Christmas season, our website and our OLTP workloads on the most scalable Oracle databases that we could find in those days, which were rack configurations. And we had a major outage because of which our service was down for, I think, 15 hours. We lost millions of dollars uh, at that point. And Jeff asked Warner, who's our CTO, to come up with a better solution because he couldn't go through next year when the, hopefully the business was going to be much bigger and have an outage again. And then Warner and many other folks wrote a paper which has become a must-read paper in the distributed systems. It's the Dynamo paper 
which really laid out many other design principles which have led to the whole design of these new class of databases, which are the NoSQL databases. And DynamoDB is certainly based on the design principles that were you know, laid out in this paper. And this was designed, really, the requirement was scale and availability about all else. Just make sure database never goes down, is scalable without limits. And those are some of the th reasons why we uh, started with NoSQL. In fact, these are the questions we asked back in 2010 when we started working on DynamoDB. And we said, OK, let's start from a completely clean slate. Let's even take away the constraint that a database has to be compatible with relational, hence the name NoSQL. And what could we design if we had no constraints? Could we give customers a set of benefits that they will not get from relational? And we concluded that there were a set of things we could do, as I was alluding to. We, we believed that we could design a database that was scalable without limits. You could start with a table, create a table, start writing to it, and never be told what the size of the limit of the database is. In fact, the largest single table that I have in DynamoDB is over 100 terabytes. I don't know why people did that, but they did. OLTP database, that's 100 terabytes single table. And you don't have to think about sharding. You don't have to think about how it scales. We take care of all of that as magic behind the curtain, if you will. You just keep writing to this database. And if it gets to a size where we think we need to shard it, we'll shard it behind the scenes. We'll continue to give you the performance you were getting. And all of a sudden, when it's sharded, it starts giving you more performance, becomes bigger, et cetera. You can start out with an application and test use cases that maybe has 10 users. And then you go into production, and maybe you are an application which is going to be very popular, let's say, at uh, Super Bowl. And you're going to have a million users uh, looking at it or using your application for the four hours of Super Bowl. You can just turn the dials and increase the number of reads and writes the database does, and it scales magically. So it's, it's really designed to be a scalable database without limits, both on the size of the database as well as on the I.O. that it does, which is the reads per second, reads request per second, and write request per second. And it's designed to be highly available. This is a database where when you do a write, it writes to three availability zones, makes sure that if there is a failure, nobody notices it. The reads and writes go to the other copies which are available, and it just keeps working. So if you're interested in high availability, high scalability, elasticity, and you're designing a new application, our recommendation would be to use DynamoDB because it's a highly scalable, highly available database. And here are some customers that use it. Uh, these guys are doing it at massive scale. I'll give you some examples of the scale at which these folks work. So Lyft is a customer which I'm sure all of you guys are familiar with. For the taxi rides during peak times, they have to scale this database to do 8x the number of rides, which means they have to scale the database to go with it. And all they have to do is make an API call and say to us, hey, if I was using, I don't know, 10,000 reads and 10,000 writes a second, make it 100,000 reads and 100,000 writes a second, and 20 minutes later, we would have resharded your entire database and it'll be back to doing 100,000. When the peak is over, you can dial it down and say, get me back to 10,000. And 20 minutes later, we are back to 10,000. Uh, and these guys have been using it scale since, uh, in this case, 2014, and uh, they've been super happy with it. In fact, the largest customer I have in terms of IO rates is a customer that does millions of writes per second against a single table. Okay, let me quickly go into caching, which is something that we think of as part of the NoSQL set of uh, services as key value store, if you will. And here, what we offer is an in-memory cache, which is a managed service. So the way this started is that in 2010, we had just launched, uh, I think we were into the first six months of having RDS out there, and many customers were starting to use it. And some of these customers came to us and said, this makes sense, but I use a memcached service, or if you will, on EC2, along with my database, this is a common usage pattern of MySQL and MemcacheD in those days, and I'd like you to make 
the elastic, uh, make the caching as simple through a managed service as you've done with RDS. And that's really why you know, we built a service based on a request from a customer or a set of customers. And working with them, we designed a service. Over the years, we've enhanced it to support Redis, which has become a very popular in-memory uh, key value store, if you will, and has some really nice properties and features. And this is fully managed, zero admin, just like RDS is. As I described, it does uh, these two engines. With Redis, we do things like multi-AZ, so you can have this be available in multiple AZs, just like I spoke with RDS. And we will detect and fail over to your caching uh, node that, uh, in case of failure, needs to be dealt with. We recently supported Redis cluster to give you more scalability. So it's a service that is used quite broadly. Here are some of the customers who use it. Um, some of these are familiar from previous slides. As you can see, people use this with RDS or with DynamoDB as a caching layer on top, top of the database. Here's an example of a customer. This is, again, a, you know, if you will, Grab Taxi is like the Uber or Lyft of Asia. They are very popular in Singapore and many other countries. And these guys uh, use caching because they want to make sure they are a highly performant application. Okay. So that's NoSQL, and I would say if you're designing a brand new application, you don't have constraints of being on relational, always start with DynamoDB. Let me go quickly into big data and talk about the services that we have in that space. The most recently announced service this morning is Athena, which is available in general availability as of today, so you can use it. Uh, let me quickly go into the features of these services, and I'll speak to the reasons why we built this service. Uh, Redshift is a service that we have had since early 2013. It was the service we announced at our first reInvent in 2012 and made it available in early 2013. It's a petabyte scale relational MPP data warehouse. So it's a traditional data warehouse done for the cloud and has multiple nodes, as I'll speak to. It comes in both SSD and hard disk formats, depending on the kinds of performance characteristics you're looking for has built-in security, including customer managed keys, and this is something we do across all of our services. And it starts at $1,000 a terabyte per year is the way to think about it. Most people who buy data warehouse systems think in terms of the size of data and the dollars they spend. The industry benchmark for other products or other players in the space is somewhere between $10,000 per terabyte per year to $50,000 per terabyte per, per year. So it's quite a bit cheaper, and you can start at 25 cents an hour is the lowest price you spend. So, you know, a cup of coffee that you spend on Starbucks will go pretty far in terms of trying to use this product and see if it works for you. So why did we build this service? So the reason why we built it is in, uh, you know, when we were thinking about it, we found that we didn't actually have at that point, obviously, a solution. And we had some fairly large customer back in, you know, 2010, 2011, when we were thinking about this, uh, who were born in the cloud startups and gaming companies. But since they didn't have any way to do analytics on the data they were collecting, they were moving this data on premise, running a Vertica cluster or a Teradata cluster and then bringing the data back into their application running on AWS, which to us felt totally backward. And then we had customers that had migrated everything to us, even in 2010, uh, but they couldn't turn off their data center because they still needed to run a Teradata cluster because we didn't have a data warehouse. And then the other thing we saw was that uh, even in 2010 when we were thinking about this, you know, it was obvious that the world was connected, social networking, mobile devices, onslaught of uh, IoT devices, when we're starting to see it was going to generate a huge amount of data. And we had customers that had a lot of data, but we were finding that given the cost of these data warehouses at ten to $50,000 a terabyte, you know, they had to make a business case as to why the data that they had created, generated, and stored maybe in S3 should be analyzed because they had to make a business justification, an ROI case, which to us felt like backwards, that 90% of the data being generated is being thrown on the floor literally because you can't justify analyzing it. So what can we do so that we design a system that solves that problem so that you can 
analyze 100% of your data, not just 10%. And that's why we designed the service, to design something that was so cheap and so scalable that you could address all of your data and build a data warehouse that could be used for it. And this is what led to the kind of architecture we used for, uh, for Redshift, where we designed an MPP architecture instead of a single instance data warehouse. And when we launched the service, we launched it so you could have 128 nodes, each with each instance at the time was two terabytes. You could get up to a total of roughly two petabytes of data on a single cluster. And we actually have customers that are doing it. One of our customers does 10 petabyte data warehouse using Redshift. And we did it at $1,000 a terabyte. We picked that number. Uh, certainly, we tend to do things in a way that causes us to have a lot lower cost. We certainly don't live on 90% gross margin uh, as a business, so we're able to offer much more attractive prices to customers. And really, we were after enabling the use cases where all the data that was being generated could be analyzed, and that's why we priced it the way we did. And the thing that you get with this product is, if you use it, you'll find that it gives you much better performance compared to your traditional data warehouse. People have moved from Oracle, Vertica, Teradata, SQL Server, and pretty much all of the various systems that are available on-premise. And the consistent feedback we get is that it is moving to Redshift increases performance from anywhere from 4x to 10x based on their use case. And the cost goes down significantly. So it's 10 times better, 10 times cheaper. It's very few things in life where life gets better and cheaper at the same time. So it's, it's interesting. And because of this reason, it used to be our fastest growing service till Aurora came along, and now it's our second fastest growing service. But we are super excited about it. Here are some customers that use it. Um, Adobe, Pinterest, Yelp, NTT Docomo, lots and lots of customers that are using this at scale for analyzing their data. And NTD Docomo is actually the customer that I was speaking to. The slide is a few days old, and it says that they are using it for six petabyte uncompressed data. Actually, the number now is more like 10 petabyte uh, uncompressed data, which is something that they've done recently. And they are seeing significant improvement in performance and significantly lower cost compared to what they were doing before. Let me speak to the second service that we have, which is EMR. This is our managed Hadoop service, and it's used for all of the Hadoop distributions. You know, you can use Spark with it, Presto with it, Hive, Taz, Impala. Uh, it's probably, at this point, the most current distribution of any player in the space, and it's very broadly used uh, by our customers. You saw this morning, Finra came up and talked about how they're using all of our services, and certainly, EMR is a big portion of the service they use, and this has got all of the characteristics that I've talked about. So far, it's fully managed, gives you all the flexibility. This is HIPAA compliant, so you can use it for all kinds of workloads where that is important. It gives you encryption, security, all the things you would expect from a managed service. And again, the reason why we designed it is because customer wanted, to give us, wanted us to offer something based on Hadoop where we could give them open source analytics framework and use all of the technologies that I talked about and benefit from the elasticity that AWS offers. The two things that are unique about it is that the way EMR works is that you keep your data in S3, and it does analytics on S3 because it really supports HDFS on S3. It also uses uh, other ways to reduce your total cost because of the way it works, so it's something that a lot of people are using. Here are some examples of customers that are using uh, EMR. All of our major customers tend to use it at this point. And then, of course, Hatina, which was something that was talked about this morning, so I'm not going to go into too much detail on it. Basically, the idea is that even though EMR and Redshift fulfill all the major use cases for scalable data warehouses or analytics, there are use cases where people are trying to do ad hoc queries without having to set up clusters. The data is sitting in S3 and they want to be quickly able to run queries against it, and this is something you can do without having to set up any clusters, without having to manage any 
um, hardware, which you simply come to a console, you make a set of queries. We give you a JDBC driver with it, so if you want to use your favorite BI tool with it, like Tableau or something else, that will be integrated. It's already integrated with QuickSight, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, so that you can run completely analytics against your data without having to set up any infrastructure. You could write SQL queries, or if that's even harder than you want to, you can run, run a BI tool and directly access data sitting in S3. Here are some customers, early customers, that uh, have been in private beta with us. And of course, the service is available today. So uh, from what I'm told by my team, there's been a lot of demand for this service since this morning. Let me quickly go into analytics and quickly run some of the highlights there for services like QuickSight and Elasticsearch. So again, QuickSight was a service that we designed a few years ago. It's something that we previewed last year, and we have had it in production for some time now this year. And it's basically designed to be, if you will, a companion to all the data stores in which you're storing your data. So the, you know, if you take something like Redshift and make it so easy and so cheap for you to store all your data, then you have to think about how do you reduce the cost, increase the ease of use and speed of analytics to go with that. And that was really the reason why we designed this service. And it's really designed to be, if you will, the next generation service. It's fully cloud-based. It's, so it's a SaaS service. There's no software to install anywhere. It's a browser that you use, and it gives you all of the features uh, in a browser. It also has a companion mobile client, which gives you all the features on a mobile device. Uh, we have today an iPhone and iPad version, and we will make the Android version available here uh, shortly. So basic idea is to give you something that's a companion for all of the data that you're storing in Redshift and RDS and other services. The thing that is pretty neat about it is that it auto-discovers all of your data that is sitting in AWS. So if you have a Redshift cluster or RDS or S3, it'll go detect that you have that in the account in which you're running uh, QuickSight and automatically make that available to you. It will also do other neat things, like if you're trying to run a query where, let's say, you're looking at you know, my favorite example, which is revenue by time, it will tell you that, well, something like that should be done with a line chart. Or if you're trying to do you know, something else where you're looking at revenue by a product category, it will say, well, that maybe is best done using a bar chart or a, you know, some kind of a pie chart. And it does this auto graphing for you so that you don't have to think about how to pick the right kinds of graph types for the kinds of analytics you're trying to do. So it makes it much easier for you to do the analytics. <clears throat> Here's an example of a customer that uses it and is super excited about it, MLB Advanced Media, which uh, has been using it for looking at the dashboards for the things that people are doing with their, uh, with their games and so on. So this is super exciting. I guess I haven't figured out how to do this uh, clicker yet. OK, let me quickly hit the highlights on uh, Elasticsearch, which is our third fastest growing service. And it's been out there since uh, about this time last year. We launched it as a service. It's really a you know, service based on the Elasticsearch technology. And it's really used for both analytics as well as distributed search. It's, again, a managed service, just like all the other services are. So you don't have to deal with the muck associated with it. It's tightly integrated with the rest of the AWS services. And uh, people use it for two use cases. One is log analytics and operations, which is bulk of what people do it for. I think 60, 70, 80% of the customers are really using it for log analytics and operational monitoring kinds of use cases. But some people also use it for traditional search, as an example, which is, tends to be about 20 or 30% of the use cases. Here are some customers that use it. Uh, it's being used, at, again, at scale, because of which it's a fast-growing service for us. And here's an example of a use case where Adobe is using it. And they are doing it with the, you know, doing an analysis of operational data. The scale at which they use it is quite significant, because so they're making something like 200,000 API calls per second. And this is something where they use Kinesis to bring the data into Elasticsearch and then do the analysis and use, uh, uh, use the service for it. OK, so that really brings me to the end of my talk. And 
one of the questions that people have uh, for me usually when I give this talk is, you have a lot of services. Help me figure out when to use which service. And I've talked about that a little bit as we've gone through the discussion, but let me highlight, hit the highlights again. So if you have an existing application, chances are that it's probably using some kind of a relational database. And if you're bringing that over, and if you want to stay with the same relational engine, then you can use RDS with that engine as, as the engine of choice. Certainly, if it's a relational database, you should run it with RDS. That's going to give you the best availability, the lowest cost, and the least amount of headaches in terms of lost sleep. And uh, if you are using MySQL, we would highly recommend you use Aurora. If you're using Postgres, we would highly recommend the version that is about to come out would be the one of choice. And in both of those cases, we make it really easy for you to migrate your data. So if you have data in RDS or in EC2 or on-premise by using various tools, including data migration service that I talked about, you'll be able to move the data. If you're on um, commercial databases, you have a choice certainly to run those databases on RDS, if you so choose. Or if you're looking to reduce the cost or improve the performance or not have to deal with the audits and licensing hassles, then you may think about going to open source databases. And we're seeing actually quite a trend of people moving their databases to open source. And I think this is something that, with the availability of Aurora, even gets going at a faster pace. So I would say existing applications tend to be relational, and they are best served with uh, RDS and various engines. If you're designing a new application, we highly, highly recommend that you design the application in such a way that it can be served using NoSQL databases, which is uh, typically what we do at Amazon. In fact, if you're a developer at Amazon, in our retail business or anywhere else, both outside of AWS as well as inside, we train you to first use NoSQL, because we think that gives you the highest scale, highest availability, and the least headaches. But there are some use cases where you cannot avoid using the relational semantics. You, know, you need more query capability, you need joins, you need transactions, what have you. In those cases, on an exceptional basis, we take that part of the application or that application which needs it and put it on relational. And I would suggest the same pattern for you guys if you're designing new applications for the cloud. Unless you think the application isn't going to be successful, it's going to probably get more usage and more customers than you might imagine. And having to re-architect a highly successful service while it's taking traffic is a nightmare. So design it from the beginning to be highly scalable. But if you do need to use relational, then use Aurora as uh, something to use. If you're doing data warehousing in BI, use Redshift with QuickSight. This is something that Andy spoke at length this morning, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. But traditional data warehouses are best served, where you have structured data and you need uh, repeated the same queries to do that in an optimized way with Redshift and use QuickSight with it. If you're doing something which is unstructured data or you want to use Hadoop or those kinds of frameworks, then you're better off using either Athena or using EMR. And for things where you're dealing with log analytics, operational data, or doing search, then Elasticsearch is the way to go. So with that, I will be available if you have other questions. But this is the end of my talk. And uh, thank you for coming over.